Hello, everybody. Hi, Mr. Mara. How are you? I'm good. Where are you? I hear your voice, Julie, but I don't see you on my screen. You can see us on the screen? You gotta be out there somewhere. Right here. Oh, there you are. I, I just wanted to be. You had your mask on. I didn't recognize you. That's okay. right. Eric, you're going to have to carry the Riverside flag alone tonight because uh, Loretta also has a, a conflict. So, uh, personal matter. Yeah, I can't help but look at that City of Revere view and I uh, get the feeling that it's like there's some sort of a hostage taking going on. <laughs> 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 it looks dark. We were talking about Hollywood Squares. <laughs> well, see, it's now that you're out of the building, Bob, you have a different perspective on what it's going to work there. I think I'm the hostage, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, a lot. You can see that. You want to come back. Oh, right, can you zoom back a little bit? Julie, with the camera? I know. We both look like we're, you know, you have to come now. Yeah, I think there's enough wide in the. You can do it from the remote. Good evening. Zoom back. We're trying to get Paul and Frank down. That's as far as it goes. So we have to push the camera back. I'm going to put it back where it was. You can push it back to push the wall. Push it back a little bit as far as it goes. Just a little better. Hey, Nick, haven't I seen you someplace before? <laughs> Nick had the Revere Conservation Commission meeting last night. So we're going to wait a few more minutes. Can everybody hear us and see us? We don't want, I've been attending Zoom U, so I want to make sure that tonight is, there's no glitches. So I bet you tonight something's going to happen. You're getting better at this, Julie. You're getting better. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Something tells me Ashley Milnick had a hand in it. <laughs> She's the best. Uh, yeah, absolutely is. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Rosalie Vincent has just joined us. I think so. Just by yeah. just audio. I think, huh? She should be logging on soon. Nope. This is Ricky Serino. I'm filling in. Okay. Ricky. Okay, Ricky. Always welcome. We're going to give it one more minute and then we're going to begin. And for those that can make it, uh, the meeting as usually is being recorded by Revere TV. So everybody will able to access it after the fact. You know, I always know. I believe Council Powell just signed on. Um, JP, great. Hey, John. Good looking group. Who do we have in the audience? Okay. Oh, okay. And we have, and I think we, at this point, I believe we have everyone that we should just start. And John McAllister, is Jay joining us tonight? No, he has a, um, another meeting tonight in Salem that he has to attend to, so it'll just be me. Okay. Okay, just uh, run the audience again so I can just see start on time and equally importantly end on time. So uh, let's get started. Uh, I think I know everyone here and I think everyone knows me, but I'm Bob O'Brien, Director of Economic Development for the City of Revere and the moderator for the master planning process for the Revere Riverfront District. Uh, this is the third meeting of the master planning group. There will be four 
Uh, this meeting will focus on the development potential of the G and J parcel, which is a matter of interest to uh, all in attendance, among others, and particularly to me, given my position. Uh, but before we get to that topic, as usual, our uh, consultant team, led by uh, uh, David Boys and Amy Corte of Arrow Street, in conjunction with uh, landscape designers uh, Copy Wolf and uh, engineer uh, Lloyd's Register, uh, will bring us up to date on what has brought us to that point, uh, to this point, I should say, in the process before uh, we get into the presentation of the development potential itself. So, David and Amy, I will turn it over to you and you can uh, bring us up to date on what's been happening for the last two meetings and where we stand right now. David? Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, so tonight's agenda, as Bob mentioned, um, one of the big topics is really going to be uh, the development site, um, and not just the G and J site, but really the three private properties that are part of this master plan. Um, we talked a bit last week about the boathouse. Um, we'll talk a bit about some vision for the um, the Mirage. Um, we don't, you know, this is not about architecture. This is about a vision for what these uh, what these sites can become. Sorry, we're having a bit of technical difficulty here, but we'll fix that shortly. I just did a... James did, Julie. Mm -hmm. um, so we, as always, we wanna start with a quick recap of what we heard from the last meeting and how that's actually uh, influenced what we're gonna show you tonight. Um, the first thing we really wanna do, we've, we've gone back to the Gibson uh, Park plan and we had a couple options last week. We were looking at different um, you know, sort of different pro uh, program components. We've, we think that we've narrowed it down uh, based on the comments to come up with uh, at least a master plan that makes sense. It doesn't necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily going to be the final plan as it gets built someday, but it's a master plan that incorporates all of the pieces that um, you've been asking for. Redgate is here with us tonight to talk about the G&J site, uh, and then we'll go into kind of an overall view of the master plan and how these private properties work as part of the, the, the vision for this 19 acre site. Uh, again, we talked a lot about traffic and last week we moved the traffic discussion up or the, or the access discussion up. Um, there were a couple of big issues really. Um, and, and, you know, not surprisingly, the big issue was how do we make sure that the access for, uh, that comes from 1A is only, is only emergency access only into the, the Riverside neighborhood. And we can show you that a little bit more about that. Um, we're going to also talk about the, um, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the uh, park plan and showing more parking in that park plan. Um, and then we're going to talk about, um, as we said, the continuation of the master plan in front of the Mirage and with access to the public pier. The park program, and Sean will talk about this in a little bit more detail, but we've incorporated pickleball, um, We've gone back to four tennis courts and we have a concept of a slightly different concept of how we could incorporate bocce into the district. Um, and then uh, we, you know, again, have a, a layouts for the tennis and the multi-use field. Just go to the next one. <laughs> yeah, so as David mentioned, this is kind of a, a bit of a uh, kind of a merging of the two plans we talked about uh, last week, I guess, already, um, or before the holidays, excuse me. Uh, so what we're showing, kind of the, the central feature being the illuminated multipurpose field. We're currently showing that it's 210 by 360 feet. And, and really what that means is it's a little hard to read. I know there's a lot of dashed lines in there, but it essentially gives us the ability to do two uh, U10 or a soccer field, and those run 
essentially kind of left and right on the page. They're the smaller squares in the center. So we can get two of those running simultaneously. And then lengthwise, we've got the ability to do a single U12 uh, soccer field, which is roughly 150 by 240, running the length. And then the overall length is then really driven by the ability to put a football field on there. So the, the longest dimensions top to bottom, um, we're going to be in the 150 to 360 range for a, a full-size football field. So uh, kind of the length is driven by football and the width is really kind of driven more by the, uh, the U10 fields to be able to get that combination of uses. And then likewise, we've got the uh, existing back or backstop, excuse me, and the, uh, the baseball, softball, little league kind of infield occurring basically in its current location today, as well as a similar size seatings, kind of bleacher seating, uh, just directly below the uh, the infield on the left. Yeah, exactly. So that's very much um, in the exact same locations as is out there today. Um, the other pieces that are existing, um, that are carryover are the existing tennis courts. And then right below that, once again, is the existing playground. So those pieces, really easy, We're still working with the, uh, the current locations in that design. And then what we've done is because of the uh, really the size of the multi-purpose field, we're just we're running into some dimensional width challenges, which we talked about a week and a half ago, I guess. Um, so the new tennis courts, um, we know there was a comment about ideally having those right next to each other, but given the width of the field and trying to maximize that, we've had to pull those down. So we still have those. Um, and there has been a comment as of even as late this afternoon, they talk about the possibility of having those illuminated as well. Um, so the tennis, two groups of twos, and then right above the tennis on the right side will be the ability to have a permanent uh, two pickleball courts uh, located in, in that location. So kind of starts to get us in kind of the... And then... Um, the existing parking, we're right about 36 spaces. If you're looking at that being double loaded, as you extend that to the left, then we've extended that current uh, kind of bank of parking, if you will. And then we've gone to a single loaded configuration as you get closer to the tennis. So it's really a drive lane and then a parking lane. And overall between those spaces and the new lot closer to the uh, development parcel, we're up at, uh, I think, 95 spaces total. Can so, I jump in? Yeah. We, we felt it was important to run that parking closer to the community boating center because it gives us the ability to have real flexibility in the parking. As, as you know, that site right there where the new parking and even part of the tennis courts is all part of that private community, that private uh, boat yard site right now. So it's really an expansion of the park. Um, and I know we talked last week with... Um, the North Shore boating that they could they could walk further, but if we felt like there was a risk that people might actually try to run through the Riverside community if we didn't get parking close enough to the building to unload a kayak and and easily get to the boating center. So that's why we extended the parking in that area. And I think the other thing to talk about as we get into more detail on the stormwater elements as well, we've talked about doing a a, a permeable paving material for that uh, for that parking as well. And I think the other thing that we're gaining by having that extension as well, David, is the notion of emergency access into there. We can, it gets to be a really short distance that I think we can easily control as we kind of finalize the, uh, the configuration around community boating in the end of that lot. So I think, I think those are both real positives for access as well as the emergency access. Uh, obviously, it's controlled, as we've talked about before, but the, the proximity there is, is advantageous as well. Um, let's see, so pieces we haven't talked about. Between the tennis courts and the parking is our community garden space, the kind of uh, triangular shape. Uh, yeah, there you go, thank you. And then just below that uh, would be the location for the proposed dog park. And that's kind of surrounded by green space. Um, and what you'll see in one of the, the later broader master plan spaces, we're, we're looking at obviously the, the green zone between the dog park and the 1A um, on ramp is is, is topo or topography, excuse me, as well as a, a good green tree canopy buffer. So, kind of extending that green down and using those for rain gardens, and kind of having that seamlessly all tied together as, as green space and certainly meeting uh, stormwater uh, uh, needs as well. Well, is, is kind of all tying together at that end of the park. Um, let's see. 
as we kind of go around, I don't want to forget the water's edge because that's really what's driving the whole uh, the riverfront development here is the ability uh, to to expand upon the community boating and turn that into a, certainly a, uh, uh, an amazing amenity uh, for the neighborhood as well as the park. Uh, the introduction of the dock and the launching for the uh, the boats, the kayaks, um, the uh, the rowing as well. And then as you start to go up along the waterfront, we're looking at the opportunity to introduce some uh, some seating in there and having that be a really kind of informal, non-structured, if you will. Uh, if you can imagine reclaiming some of the salvage seawall stones and having those start to be stepped seating elements, almost like bleachers, if you will. But they're you know they're not very big, if you will, but that would be some great places to kind of congregate, to watch those that are on the water. Um, it's some great views back into further into downtown. I can imagine that being pretty spectacular with sunsets. Uh, it's just another really nice kind of element to get closer and interact with the uh, with the water. As you continue up, um, looking at that white, there we start to envision that being more of an elevated boardwalk. And when I say elevated, I think it's really more about having that start to be elevated above the water and the, uh, the salt marsh that you're starting to get along those edges so that you're feeling, once again, kind of more above and but still much closer to the water. Whereas the red areas that are between the multi-purpose field and the, uh, and the water's edge there is probably more of a pathway, kind of a walkway as opposed to elevated. So yeah, really trying to tie that all together within that green, or excuse me, with the red lines. Uh, we talked a little bit about this last time, so we wanted to make sure we brought them back into the plan was the putting green and the and kind of the drive netting range elements that are there that we know the golf team uses and as you kind of continue around the development parcel within the broader red uh component starts to be more of the uh, continuation of that boardwalk that will tie us into the the possible public pier uh which is another really amazing amenity to be able to get out even further into the water and then likewise the extension of that uh that walkway network into a future or a potential, if you will, future connection to the uh, Port of Point of Pines uh, neighborhood on the opposite side of one A. Uh, let's see. I think the the other thing that we didn't talk about is the basketball court. We did pull that over, so it's kind of a standalone piece. We've had some kind of fun conversations about what that could be, uh, but uh, having that kind of be more of a, a kind of a little removed piece fits in pretty nicely there. And then we've talked about the introduction of art and kind of this gateway signature <laughs> element into the, uh, to the park itself as a center feature within the uh, the roundabout element that's right there. Um, I'm just trying to think with walkways and paths, we're trying to make sure we're really tying into both Riverside. We're trying into the uh, kind of what I'll call the, the main entry um, off of that rotary that gets back over to Point of Pines neighborhood with making that very pedestrian friendly as well as I said, the, the potential future, trying to get at least like kind of three entry points, if you will, to, uh, to get into the park for pedestrians. Uh, Sean, I think we have a couple of questions uh, from uh, Eric Lampadecchia. Eric? Hi, Sean, good evening. Um, loving the new plan. I think you've integrated a lot of the elements that we were questioning or asking for uh, in our last meeting. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about the, um, the additional rain garden and that additional green space along 1A and how that affects flood capacity. So I know at our last call, um, it didn't sound like there was a tremendous increase in flood capacity storage. Would that change if uh, under this new configuration? I'll take that if you want, Sean. Sure. Um, sure, this is John McAllister. Um, yeah, so that rain garden, so what we're gonna try and do is break up the existing flowing flow pattern that goes onto the haze in, um, towards there in Mills. And, what's coming down the embankment off of Route 1A will be brought up towards the park. And yeah, we did uh, provide a lot more uh, in terms of square footage of rain gardens all along the side. And we're also trying to break up the flow. So if it doesn't concentrate as much, it's easier to manage. So by having three rain gardens rather than one big one, you're actually able to um, offset some peaks a little. And we're still going to have, it's not shown in this plan because it's all going to be subsurface, but we're still intending to have the, the pump station and um, actually, with the multi-purpose field, um, we have a bigger subsurface storage for um, for flood storage for off-peak hours for the winter and a high tide event as well. So th this is an improvement over um, of what we showed last week. There is more capacity uh, to quantify it. It's it's a little different because it's, it's not a pure volume because it comes as it hits. You know what I mean? It's kind of a 
a, th a three-way process, but it is an improvement over what we showed last week in terms of capacity. John, does the salt marsh planting also have a flood control impact? A absolutely. Um, more for the the flood from the uh, from the rivers as much as much as much from the storm um, from the rainfall. But yes, there's two, we yeah. did add in two two salt marsh features, one by the dock for the community boating, one up top by the overlook, and those have uh, a, a big impact on uh, flood flood uh, and resiliency capacity. Eric, did you have another question or comment? Uh, I guess I'm just kind of reflecting back on our first meeting when we talked about uh, rising sea levels and how that's going to impact the neighborhood. And I know that's also part of the MVP study. So just keeping that in mind, I mean, I don't know if it's measurable in terms of your proposal that you guys have here. How many inches or how many feet of water do you think this would help with in terms of flooding? Sure. So um, that's a very good point. We did actually, um, Al and Frank set up a meeting where we're uh, consulted with the MVP people that are working, and I think they had their first kickoff meeting this week. So they're looking at it more of a um, the, bit, the larger study area, which is going to be more effective at actually providing a sea level rise. But what we have here, um, so we're increasing flood storage, uh, which is always a positive thing. We're providing resilient features as well. So it's more flood resistant. It might not stop flooding, but it'll be more flood resistant. And we have um, it, it been tweaking it back and forth, but roughly we can get about two acre feet of water um, flood storage on the thing. So that's essentially two acres by one foot high which, um, you know, if we can get that out of the neighborhood and over into the, into the, um, under the ball field, that's a pretty significant amount of water to at least hold off for a couple hours. Can I make a suggestion that, you know, this is something that we're going to want to quantify uh, as much as we can in the final report. Maybe we can have a, a few more numbers next week when we come back with, because we're really trying to finalize the plan and make sure that this is the plan that, that the city, um, and the group feels is the strongest to move forward with. Okay, we have, uh, Eric, if you're finished, we have a question from Councillor Powers and then from Nick Malaysian of the Conservation Commission. John? Yes, Paul, uh, can you hear me? We can, yeah. Okay. You know, I, I realize this this can be a, uh, a great uh, and positive uh, projects for the uh, Point of Pines and the city of Revere in general. Uh, again, my main... John, it's cut out. Uh, John doesn't have a great internet connection down there. Nick, while we're waiting for John to return. Uh, I, would like to, I would like to see a plan to mitigate the traffic, and I would like to see a... Uh, plan uh, by certified engineers to uh, uh, mitigate the uh, flooding on uh, Mills Avenue and the uh, potential increase of flooding once you uh, develop uh, the uh, boat, yeah, uh, J and G site rather. Uh, you know, and then I have a question with regard to the pump station that we put in. It's a brand new pump station. I think it's seven, eight, nine years old uh, on the runway. Uh, it's but from what I understand, working fine. I'd like to know uh, what the capacity uh, would be with relative to uh, sewerage uh, going from uh, Riverside and now adding on to the uh, the boat, the uh, tow yard, uh, into that pump station. If it's uh, if it's uh, capable of uh, handling all of that, and if not, how uh, how we can uh, mitigate that? So again, I I think that. Doing something with the boat yard, I think, is a, a tremendous uh, idea, and it, it, I think it will be a tremendous uh, positive addition to the uh, city of Revere. You don't look at those tow trucks <coughs> in your city of Revere. Uh, I think it will complement the uh, the yacht club on the other side. Uh, you know, two very picturesque areas uh, to look at coming through the city. Again, I. I, the only thing I don't want to see is something that's going to uh, uh, not address the flooding, not address the traffic, and in fact, uh, uh, make it more harmful to the city of Revere. So uh, I'd like to see uh, some more information uh, with regard to the flooding, what, what plan is going to be, 
and uh, what we're doing with the funding. John, I think Frank Stringy might have a couple of comments with regard to some of your observations. Frank? I'd like yeah. to hear them. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, we all know the capacity of that new sewer pump station is, uh, is adequate enough to handle the Riverside and Point of Pines presently. Um, so with the additional wastewater flow projected from any further development in this area, it would be necessary to increase the capacity of the wet wells. The pumps themselves are adequate. Uh, the sizing of the pipes are adequate, but the wet wells would have to be lowered to handle additional flow and hold the wells being pumped out. So that's an improvement we know has to be undertaken and, and will be undertaken as this project moves forward. And, and the traffic also, I... I think we're gonna have a uh, discussion on that later, John. Yeah, that'll be later on in the meeting, Council Power. I guess what I'd like to see is a, a plan that not only addresses the boat yard, uh, the uh, G&J towing site, the traffic and the flooding in the area and the uh, sewerage. I think that'd be good to come up with something like that. I think it's a great project. Okay. Uh, Nick Malaysen? Yeah, my, just a, an observation. I know, I think it was John McAllister that said it. We're going to get two acres by one foot of flood storage. Is that correct, approximately? Is he there? Yeah, I believe so. That is correct. I think he's frozen, okay. but that is what he said, yes. Yeah. All right, so how much is there now? How much flood storage is there now? There's none, correct? Essentially, there's some storage in the field itself, uh, but much of that or some of that will remain. Uh, John, so you're back with us. Yes, I am. Sorry about that. That's um, all right. Could you, would you mind repeating that? I dropped out. So you, you said we're going to have about two acres of flood flood storage by about one foot. How much is the, how much is there now? Not much, correct? Not much is a good yeah. I didn't quantify <laughs> exactly what it is, but yeah, it's a market improvement over what is there exactly. Yeah. So there's going to be a, dr a drastic improvement over what's there. Still might not be enough, but a drastic improvement of what's there already. Exactly. Right, that was just my observation. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. And as, yeah. as David indicated, we'll have some more uh quantifiable figures probably by the next meeting mm -hmm. kevin o'malley you have a question <clears throat> kevin you could you just uh unmute and identify yourself uh, by address in particular <clears throat> kevin okay Oops, so, let's go to lisa. so let's go to lisa Pe uh, peterson Lisa, are you available? Okay. Gary had a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can. Oh, thank you, sorry. Um, a few things. First of all, the um, dog waste area in the park right now is what you have as the passive area. Um, I'm not excited about having it moved down to the flooding area by the residents. For a couple of reasons people are going to park all along thayer ave and walk their dogs over there there's no way they're going to go around and it's also going to have dog poop floating into your storage areas with the rain water which is going to go out into the ocean uh, i don't like that and i don't like that they changed the flow of the walk along the uh, river so that it empties out at my driveway so that everybody's going to be parking around my driveway and um, staring into my driveway. And the other thing that I'm not happy about, or that I don't understand, is if you go to the art circle, there's a road that feeds into the existing parking. And then if you come down, there's another road that looks like it cuts through just along our neighborhood, but it's not on the highway, Overflow. like a feet to the highway. That's not there right now. You gotta be careful. And there's not say, a lot of room right across now. negative. So right. what is that? So Lisa, I can kind of walk through some of that. I think for based on your question, I'm assuming this is your first meeting with us, which is great. We're welcome, glad to have you aboard. So what you're seeing there in the center, and somebody can please correct me if I misspeak, but essentially there is a as a part of the, the new bridge. Um, design and construction, well, new design, excuse me, let me back up. 
they're relooking at the off ramp configurations of the bridge. So what you're seeing is as you're headed southbound off of 1A, you've got the ability to peel off and then you would go around that rotary and you would be able to either go to the new parking as you described, you would have the ability to get to the existing parking with that connection as you described, or you could be able to continue on around and you could drive underneath 1A and get to the uh, Point of Pines neighborhood. The, the other ramp that you described, um, likewise from Point of Pines, you would be able to come back underneath 1A, you'd go around the rotary and you'd be able to enter that, uh, that ramp to be able to continue on southbound of 1A. So you're correct, that's not there right now. But that's all part of a project that's being reviewed by uh, the state right now at that moment in conjunction with the, the new bridge uh, uh, over, um, excuse me, at 1A. So you're right, that's not there, but that's something that's being uh, reviewed and, and looked at right now. Yeah, and that would allow Lisa the opportunity to get to Route 1A southbound without going through the Riverside community. And, and what that really does for us, uh, and we're looking at it as a great positive, is to be able to create really a new front door to Gibson Park would be coming in off of that direction and really, from a vehicular standpoint anyway, separating the connections from Riverside, hopefully that's diminishing the amount of cut through traffic to get to the park through that neighborhood and it's more directed to the opposite side of the park off of the rotary. And we'll take, we'll and the dog you. poop. Well, well the dog you. poop, I mean, the park projects that we've worked on and, and I think there's definitely an enforcement. The intent is for that to be a, uh, you know, a permeable surface, but not to a point where it's a dog park well, let me back up. The intent that we discussed was having this be an off-leash area. It would be fenced, but people, dog owners, and we should supply the uh, the equipment, if you will, the bags and the trash would be to pick up after their dogs. Um, it's not just an open in your yard kind of let dogs do their business. And but yeah, it's it's obviously and maybe there's some educating we need to do. But uh, within the dog park network, it'd be great if there was a friends group or a dog group. Uh, that could start to help us within that kind of educational services. But certainly the intent is not to have that just be a dog area where they would go in and do their business uh, and just kind of leave it. Let me put it that way. Well, I understand the intent. I'm um, not well really discussing the intent. I'm talking about what's going to really happen. Yeah. And uh, it's, that's what's going to happen. People drive down to the park now. They sit in their car and they let their dog out. So there's nobody picking anything up down here. I think uh, that's a point well taken, Lisa. We will certainly take that into account. Thank um, you. And also, I don't know look, if you looked into the natural gas situation. I don't know if you're planning on using natural gas, but there's no supply down here for that. So you, if you're going to take it in from Lynn, you're going to have to build a pipeline or you're going to have to dig up all along the highway. It's a single fed feed that feeds all of the pines. It goes up to Route 1. A couple of years back, they hit the pipe because of a missed dig safe, and they put our entire area out. There's no pressure here. It's all low pressure. So please factor that into your plans. I, th I think Damien can definitely talk about that when he talks about the proposed development. Yeah, in indeed. Carol Haney, I believe, uh, has a question. Bob, just one last comment real quickly before we, um, regarding Lisa's other comment about the, the walkway kind of ending up at her driveway. Uh, I think that's all can be re reviewed and, and revisited uh, as we start to really get into probably a better idea of how that community voting works, whether that starts to run, yeah, exactly on the water's edge. I think that, Lisa, can all be resolved to uh, to make that be working better for you as well as the park that's itself. We just want to have a, yeah. the ability to get into the park and whether that's street side or it feels better than probably in the mid block that we have it, but that's a good point. We can definitely look at that. And I think that that pathway could tie back into the loop by the parking as well. Um, I, you know, I think the arrow there was not really intended to show that that's where we're expecting people to, to uh, exit the park. I think, you know, we do feel like with the new fire station uh, being built on the east side of 1A uh, and this new connection that can go through Gibson Park, um, that there's a really quick connection uh, for emergency use to go through Gibson Park to get to uh, the Riverside neighborhood. And, and really that's what the intent of that arrow, but we can definitely uh, adjust that. Thank you both. Carol Haney and then uh, Gary Ferragamo, and I think Eric has another question as well. So yeah. Carol? 
Yes, I do have a question. Um, I missed the first meeting because I didn't know about it. And during the last meeting and at this meeting, you people have been referring to the new bridge project. Yes. Are you talking about the General Edwards Bridge or are you talking about the, the next bridge? The General Edwards Bridge. We're talking about the bridge project being the replacement of the existing bridge with a new high bridge that will not be a drawbridge. That project is still some years off, but it's certainly on the planning horizon. And it certainly is needed. Yes, understood. Okay, so that is the General Edwards Bridge that will be replaced. That's correct. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you very Thank much. You. Gary Ferragamo? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, Gary, go ahead. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, I am the president of the Point of Pines Beach Association. Um, we are obviously very excited uh, about what is being planned here. Uh, we're so happy that it uh, looks like some of the best people in Revere and Arrow Street are working uh, amazingly on this project. Uh, and I want to make sure I'm coming across uh, in positive light here because this is something we've been hoping uh, to achieve for several years. Um, being the devil's advocate, the only problem I can foresee after this is completed uh, is not enough parking. You go to uh, any beach, lakefront, park area, and you're driving around for quite a while trying to find somewhere to park. This location is extremely limited and uh, ambitious. We're looking to put a lot of different um, courts and amenities in this small area, which is wonderful. However, uh, I do want to uh, voice that if we consider um, maybe toning down from four courts to three or from three courts to two and increase the parking substantially, 95 spots uh, for a football game or a basketball game will fill up an hour before the game starts. Uh, the biggest concern we have here. Uh, is parking. The overflow parking will come to the beachside point of Pines, which is where we live, I live. Uh, and that is our main concern and, I'm, and our only concern really uh, for us, uh, and I'm speaking for 350 uh, homeowners here that have voiced uh, numerous times the parking challenges we have just in a regular summer. So once this beautiful master plan is completed, it might be too late to try to uh, fix the parking woes that we could see coming down the road. So I, I really want to uh, suggest that if there's a way, and I don't mean to not be popular with, with anybody, but uh, I don't know how important it is to have a, a dog park versus people to park their vehicles. And um, again, uh, we have dog and uh I'd love to have the dog park, but we can only, we're limited to what can be built there. And this is a very ambitious, beautiful master plan. I think the only uh, drawback I see is not enough parking, everyone. Thank you, Gary. Um, Kevin O'Malley, I think, is back with us. Kevin, are you still on the line? Kevin? You might be muted. Mm, he should, uh, and you are allowed to speak, so unmute, please, Kevin. You. Kevin? Okay, let me go back then to uh, uh, Nick. I think, Nick, you had an additional comment. Nick Malayson, Conservation Commission. Yeah, and not and not from a conservation point of view, from a dog owner point of view. And I know okay. the, the last woman had a problem with the dog waste. I use the dog park all the time that's on Sargent Street. Anyone that's a, uh, a respectful dog owner picks up the dog waste and puts it in the barrel because there are bags and everything there. Unfortunately, there are people that will let a dog run around a regular park and not pick it up. But I would assume that the people that are going to use this dog park will pick up after themselves and they will need to because the city does supply supplies down on Sargent Street. I'm assuming they're going to do the same thing here. So uh, I would assume that a respectful dog owner will. 
Very good. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Eric had Eric, a question. Do you have a, another comment? Eric Lamadeke? Yeah, just a follow up for the city, given some of the infrastructural concerns that a few folks have cited. Um, have Nick Rystrom and Donnie Chairmiller, have those, those types of folks been apprised of this proposal? Or is that too early in the process? Very much so. And uh, with regard to the development site, of course, they'll be very much involved in the site plan review process, which goes down to a level of detail we're not speaking to tonight. But yes, they're very much involved and aware of this. Okay, um, it looks like we might be able to move on, David. Uh, so why don't you take it to the next slide? Okay, well, <laughs> we, we, we don't get to the, the critical issue of, of economic development, which, uh, as you all know, is of uh, particular professional interest to me. But I just want to make a couple of comments by way of introduction before I ask Damien to uh, make his presentation about the particular relevance and importance of the economic development component of this project, this master plan. Uh, and the first point I want to make is that, as, as you know from previous uh, meetings, this master planning process is being funded by the Seaport Economic Development Council of the Commonwealth yeah. of Massachusetts. And the Seaport Economic Development no. Council... No, just a thank you for your effort. That's it. You can mute. Somebody needs to be muted here. The Seaport Economic Council uh, is focused on the great point. Point. parking is quality of life issue. Gonna ask Gary. whoever is not on mute to mute, Gary. Okay. Uh, in any event, my point is that we wouldn't be having this discussion were there not an economic development component to this master plan because the Seaport Economic Council emphasizes both the waterfront aspect of its mission, but also its economic development mission. So the economic development component of this master plan process is extremely important, not just to the funding of the master plan itself, but to the follow on funding that the Seaport Economic Council will provide to implement that master plan. So that is initially very important. The second thing is it's hard to conceive the ability to transform the riverfront district as we are <clears throat> of the GNJ site. Um, it, it's, it is really the catalyst for the master planning process and without the redevelopment of the northern of the development and its gateway potential, it's hard to conceive the kind of transformation of this parcel that we are expecting to accomplish through this master plan. Third, the many of the amenities that have been previously reviewed here in this meeting and, and in previous meetings are actually going to be funded, designed, and constructed as part of this development project. So it is in that sense, something of the economic engine for a significant portion of the master plan effort. I would also emphasize from our experience in the city that we are really fortunate to have Redgate Capital as the proposed developer of this site. Redgate is known to the Revere community and the Revere community knows Redgate very well. They have had extremely successful record of investment and development in the community, exceeding $250 million thus far. They have a really informed appreciation of the potential of this site. And the opportunity to work with somebody to develop the G&J site in whom we can have confidence, who is here for the longer run, who is an important part of the community and really understands what we're trying to achieve here is extremely important. The alternative of an outside developer that we don't know and that does not know us is, is really a very unattractive possibility for this site. And finally, I would note that with regard to the reconfiguration of the transportation elements of this project, Redgate has been extremely important in providing professional engineering and design assistance to the city and to Mass DOT in terms of the reconfiguration of these transportation uh, roadways. So for all of those reasons, I think this economic development project is an absolutely integral part 
of the master planning process. And from my perspective, I think the city could not be more pleased having Redgate Capital as the proponent of this economic development uh, project as part of the Riverfront Master Plan. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of the principals of Redgate uh, Capital, Damien Zari, who is probably well known to many of the people on this call and certain to, pe uh, to people elsewhere in the Revere community. And uh, Damien, I'll leave it to you to introduce your team and to describe your conceptual plans for the development potential of the site at this stage. Great. Well, Bob, uh, can everybody hear me, number one? We can, yes. Great. Well, well, th th thank you very much for the time and thank you for the introduction. And uh, so, so tonight I'm actually joined by two members of the development team from Redgate, Liz Beggio and Melanie uh, DiGregorio. And she, uh, they're both project managers on the project. We also have Katie Cruz, uh, who is our civil engineer, who can talk and, 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 and uh, about the infrastructure related questions that have already come up. And also Brian Beisel, who is our traffic consultant is also here as well too. So he can help answer any additional questions related to traffic. But before I get into the site, I just wanted to give a, a little bit of history. Uh, we started looking at this site uh, about a, over a year ago. And when, when I first approached the owner about the site, I had no idea that the city of Revere was actually thinking about this area for a potential master plan. And at the same time, the city had no idea that I was actually pursuing this site until I put a call into Bob and I told him what we were thinking and suddenly kind of the light went off and like, oh my goodness, this is an amazing opportunity to really work together on a true public private partnership. And that's what got us really excited about it. And so, you know, after a lot of work uh, for us, it's already been over a year in terms of studying the site, understanding the site. And I want to take you uh, through some of those initial thoughts before we talk about the vision. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So, you know, in terms of our involvement in, in Revere, uh, we've been very active for the past five years, and, and overall, uh, our focus is really developing uh, mixed-use projects with a heavy focus on highly amenitized, high-end housing with creative retail components. And specifically with the retail, we, we try to introduce restaurants, which are, I think, very important to the community and also help set the tone and the image for the building. So the image you see on the left, as many of you probably are familiar with, that's 500 Ocean. Uh, that, that is a seven story project uh, with 305 units and two restaurants. When we originally pursued that project, people thought we were crazy to try to introduce retail onto the plaza level. And you know, we were very fortunate that we found a great operator. And you know, even, even in these difficult you know, pandemic times, Drift and Fine Line have been performing very well and actually outperforming, I would say, their peers in, in the core market of Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville. So we've been obviously very excited about that. The building you see on the right, this is a rendering because uh, this building is not yet complete. This is, this is a building called Ryder. It's currently being constructed at the base of Revere Beach at Elliott Circle, and it's actually a two-building project. Uh, the front building sits directly on Revere Beach, uh, which is 127 units. And then there's a rear building on Ocean Avenue, uh, which is 73 units for a total of 200 units. Same thing. Uh, we were very ambitious in terms of trying to seek, you know, a, a good retail anchor here. And I'm happy to report, and this is not public information, we actually just signed a lease for a new restaurant uh, to be at Ryder. Uh, pretty big challenge uh, to do during COVID. Uh, but we're excited that that lease is signed and the hope is that uh, construction is going to start pretty soon with hopefully an opening sometime in late spring. So hopefully another great, you know, restaurant addition to the beach and helping transform this area of, uh, of, of Revere Beach and, and ultimately the entire creative arts district that's envisioned there. So, you know, that's the spirit that we're coming with uh, as we approach uh, this project here. Next slide, please. Uh, and, you know, some of the challenges that I think everyone should be aware of because they do influence some of the decision making process, you know, as everybody can tell, this is uh, this is a tow and scrap yard located on waterfront property. So there are you can just go back a little bit. So th th there are some environmental challenges with this site that we've uncovered. Uh, this this site will have to go through an environmental remediation uh, in order to be developable. We haven't found anything to date which would require immediate notification to the state, but the soil is dirty and it's gonna to have to get remediated. 
additionally, the, the soils here are, are of very poor quality. So for us, in order to construct a building, we're actually going to be doing a very, very deep and expensive foundation system, something that you would uh, be more akin to doing a high rise. And we're not doing a high rise by any means here or planning to do a high rise. But that does add a level of, of cost to this project. And then the third thing, if you can go to the next slide, please, is really the shoreline. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever walked around the site or seen it from the General Edwards Bridge, but the shoreline is, is very degraded. Uh, collapsing in areas, there's other areas, like you can look on the, on the upper right-hand portion where, where asphalt is actually over the riprap. Uh, you know, these are all things that we've addressed with the state. Uh, they're, they're major concerns for the state. And it's going to require a lot of uh, private investment in order to uh, to help improve the shoreline. So these these are all issues that we've had to deal with uh, as we think about the development. Uh, next slide. And just so everyone understands uh, where the development will be, I'm going to show you two slides. This first slide just talks about the ownership and how big the parcels are. The second slide is going to talk about the constraints that we face, and there are a lot of constraints here. So uh, I think I've heard people mention that the site is 10 acres. Uh, it is 10 acres if you count the water sheet. Uh, so uh, a significant portion of the site is actually in the water. You know, roughly half of it, uh, about five acres, is actually uplands. And not all of it is developable uh, because there are certain constraints related to historical things as well as Chapter 91. But overall, Lot 1, including the water, is roughly 10 acres. And, and that's going to largely be the development site. Lot two that you see, the linear site where the pier is, that's a former railroad right of way. Uh, we've made the determination after speaking with the state that we will not be developing any structures on this site. The reason why is we don't believe we would get something called 4054A consent from the state. If there ever was a crossing uh, or an extension of the blue line, this may be one of the areas where it would go. We think it's highly unlikely. The state feels it's highly unlikely. That said, the state does not like to give up their rights, and they have a right to this property in the event that they were to use it. So in essence, this is going to be uh, undeveloped land uh, with primarily kind of surface improvements. The third parcel that is associated with this site is, is the one that's uh, titled Lot 3, the corner parcel. Uh, and that's going to be used to help supplement additional parking, the connections to the park, uh, a lot of the transportation improvements that we'll be talking about. There's another very important parcel, which is which is noted as land owned by National Grid. So uh, this parcel is highly restricted for a number of reasons. There's a very large electrical uh, transmission line that goes underneath this property, uh, which really renders the development potential uh, to, to, to not a lot. And it's also highly restricted by Chapter 91 jurisdiction and specifically as it relates to kind of where the mean high water is, which really precludes private development on the site. That said, that does open up doors for public development. And so the plan that we've been discussing with the city is that the city would actually acquire the site. However, we would be the ones planning it in conjunction with the city and with this master planning process and actually implementing the improvements. Uh, the other notable feature is the pier that you see coming out on lot two. Our goal is to actually uh, grant that pier over to the city as a public amenity and then hopefully improve that pier as a significant water feature for, you know, whatever it may be, fishing, uh, recreational boating. Uh, that hasn't been fully vetted out yet, but that's something that we're also in discussion. So I think just even talking about it gives you the sense that really this has been kind of a public-private discussion for a very long time. And it requires both of our efforts from the city standpoint and the private development standpoint in order to really make it work. It's a very complicated site. Uh, next slide, please. And so th these are the major constraints and, and these constraints are really what kind of dictates where you can build and kind of what you can build. So uh, the red dotted line that you see after multiple meetings with the state, this has been determined to be the presumptive chapter 91 line. So in essence, we, we are not gonna be building anything that is seaward of this line. So that's one major constraint. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see something that's entitled the Formal Railroad Right-of-Way. It's a 30-foot-wide area. Once again, that's constrained by historical constraints related to the railroads. We will not be building there. That also happens to serve as a good buffer between us and the park as well. Uh, we've talked about the National Gridland, which is in gray. 
And then we also talked about lot two, which is hatched out. We will not be building there either for the reasons that I explained. So in essence, the, the development will really be focused on the, uh, the, the lot one site. Uh, uh, we have a question from uh, Jay Bolton from the uh, Point of Pines Yacht Club, and it must relate to one of these current slides. So sure. Jay, uh, do you want to ask your question at this point? Yeah, yeah. Hi, guys. Um, I'm just wondering if you guys have looked at that pier to find the, the situation, the state that it's in right now. Uh, superficially, uh, we, we have uh, a shoreline engineer on uh, on our staff, uh, n not extensively. It's going to need extensive repair. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> putting it mildly, right? Yeah. Um, and also, I just want to let you guys know, um, we don't have to get into it now, but Kevin O'Malley's question was, well, when I texted him because he was having some technical issues, um, he basically wants to know, if, uh, if, if what type of access the neighbors may have to the dock over there by Riverside. Um, he was curious about that. And we can pick that up after, uh, Damien, I don't wanna steal your thunder, but I'm following you. So I just, I just wanna make sure that dock has been in a million pieces. It floats down the river and comes into the Yacht Club and we're continually picking up pieces of it. So just wanna make sure that uh, you knew uh, and Jay, you were talking about the dock associated where the community boating facility is supposed to go? That's the one that Kevin's curious about. The one I'm talking about is the one over by GJ. Yeah, so the, the, the one over by GJ, uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't even know which one exactly you're talking about because there's so many features there. Where, where is that exactly? The one that's to the left of the GE bridge. Okay. Your, the one yes, correct. The it's the one that's feet up, right? And there's one that just, just appears. Yeah, that, yeah, that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that one doesn't hard. look like that anymore. So I just want to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then and regarding the one Kevin was asking about, I think there's going to be a later slide talking about. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And they can address it then. Yeah, so we'll definitely pick that up. But yeah, th that pier here is going to get studied as uh, very extensively. But it's an opportunity to really do something special. It's very difficult to obviously get things like that permitted right now. The fact that it's an existing condition and we have the ability to hopefully repair it mm -hmm. uh, is going to be an important feature, hopefully to the, uh, the full activation of this waterfront. Uh, next slide, please. So, so overall, you know, we're not at a state, we haven't designed the building yet uh, and we're not at that stage. You know, the goal today is to really talk about the framework under which we'll be, de you know, designing this building. And some of the things that I'm going to be talking about are height, unit count, density, but before I do that, I just wanted to at least kind of share some inspirational images in terms of what we're hoping to create here. And, and you know, I think overall, you know, we want to, you know, utilize kind of a, a material and color palette that really, you know, works well with this kind of coastal nature. So you're seeing, you're going to see the introduction of things such as natural wood that kind of associates potentially maybe with a sailboat uh, deck area. You're going to see some darker coloration kind of in the navies and the blues that, you know, kind of really resonate kind of towards the maritime nature. We're currently exploring the idea of doing green roofs on these buildings or on portions of these buildings uh, as well. And so the design team is currently thinking about this. And as we move uh, kind of from the zoning stage to the design development stage and into the site review stage, you know, we'll, we'll continually be updating the design and working with the city and with the community to really craft the building that, that hopefully I think the city is proud of. And as all of us know, I mean, this is going to be the gateway from the north, for, from Lynn. Uh, the Yacht Club on the left, this building on the right is really gonna set the tone for Revere as you really approach uh, from, from the north. Uh, next slide, please. And then, you know, equally important, you know, these are inspirational images. I don't think we could get many of these things permitted, but hopefully they do kind of create, uh, you know, in, enlighten some of the creative juices among the, uh, the design team. But in addition to developing the building, developing the public realm is equally important. And our goal is to really create a very dynamic public realm. Our goal is to bring people here. This is not about the building. It's about connecting the building to Gibson Park. It's about weaving together uh, the Point of Pines neighborhood with Riverside, providing, you know, great access, not only vehicular and also trying to limit that obviously through the Riverside neighborhood and eliminate it actually, 
but you know, creating great you know, pedestrian and bicycle opportunities all converging here. And with that, you know, in addition to things like public seating and swings and activation, uh, you know, we're going to be working with the design team to really make this a special place where people are going to want to come and visit and really experience the nature. And the fact that this is being picked up in addition to hopefully a commuting boating center, uh, the, the new active programming uh, in, the, in Gibson Park, I think it can be a really special place uh, for the city of Revere. You know, we also want to introduce opportunities for public art. I think on one of the preliminary site plans, we showed kind of this art opportunity where the roundabout is. There's also a great opportunity to do something under the overpass where 1A is. The image you see on your left is actually something from the Fort Point neighborhood in Boston, where they create this almost nighttime you know, scene with LED lights. And this would be the kind of entry point into the private development, into Gibson Park, and hopefully something really memorable. Uh, we're probably not going to get a floating you know, TV screen, but that's maybe something we can do on our property. Uh, but there's going to be some great ideas that are going to come out of this entire process. And I think we're open to all of them, and we really want to create a special place. Uh, next slide. So uh, you've seen this plan many times. Now you're starting to see it get filled in with the private development. And just kind of big, big picture, uh, from a scale standpoint, we're thinking that this building is going to be, in terms of unit count, somewhere between Ryder and 500 Ocean. And, and we think it's going to be closer to 500 Ocean. It, it, it won't be as big because it can't be as tall. Uh, but we're thinking it's going to be somewhere north of 250 units to 280 units. Uh, the scale of the building is going to be probably a floor shorter than 500 Ocean. We're envisioning a five-story building over uh, you know, a podium that's going to have not only parking, but shrouded by hopefully some retail opportunities, some engagement opportunities for the community. From a density standpoint, uh, it's going to probably be about half as dense as either 500 uh, Ocean or even Ryder. Those projects have about an FAR of about three. This will be roughly a one and a half, and that does not include the land in the water. This is purely all the uplands land. And so those are some of the things that we're trying to work through right now uh, and try to figure out. And, and as we've talked about earlier, the idea of trying to create this site through these path connections, through activating uh, kind of the area in front of the building, one of the big things that we want to change, and this is, this is something very important for the state, is creating more of a vegetated shoreline versus what you see there right now. And so the idea is to hopefully help support the growth of existing salt marshes to do some, uh, some, some great resilient planting, salt tolerant plantings to really create more of a natural feel, something that, you, that is already created kind of on, in the Gibson Park area. So the idea is to really try to reclaim this land uh, versus, you know, its old industrial use here. And so, you know, the team is working closely uh, with the master plan team in order to try to implement all of these things. Uh, I just want to pause here and take any questions that may be specific to the potential project, because there's a lot to talk about in terms of traffic and infrastructure, and we have slides about that. But if anything specific about the project that people would like to know. I can't see people raising their hands. So um, anybody on the uh, advisory group just... Uh, Hi, this is Eric Lampedacchio. I had my hand up. I'm not sure if you guys can see it on that end, Bob. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first is, can you just explain what is an FAR? You use that acronym, but a lot of us are not familiar with this process. Yes, sorry about that. So, so, so FAR is, is an acronym for floor area ratio, and it's the way um, you, control you control density. So imagine if you had a, a 10,000 square foot lot. And if the FAR on that was one, you could, in essence, bu build a 10,000 square foot building, you know, one times 10,000. Uh, and if the FAR was three, you could build a 30,000 square foot building. And so uh, it's used as a means to kind of talk about density. And so a lot of times where you're building, you know, closer to the lot line of a building, it's of, of a site like uh, 500 Ocean or Ryder, their FAR is three. So in essence, the, the, the square footage of the building is three times the lot area of the site. Here, the density, because of the additional open space uh, and all the constraints that we have for not building along the edges or the lot two site, the density here is about half 
of 500 Ocean uh, or Ryder. So it's about a one and a half here. It's about a three in those other two buildings. Okay. Um, I just got a couple other questions for you related to this as well. Um, you mentioned Ryder and 500 Ocean, and you got you guys now have a, excuse me, congratulations on your new lease agreement with your new restaurant here coming in. Um, what are you guys envisioning for this project? Are you envisioning that lower level being a retail component, or are you envisioning this being condos or apartments? Well, so, so in terms of your first question, we would love to introduce some type of retail into this building. And obviously, you know, right now is a moment in time. Uh, it's a very challenging moment in time. We got really lucky at Ryder. Uh, I, I think we got lucky there because we, we proved it out at 500 and there's, a, and there's a high level of density of people along Revere Beach to be able to, you know, attract a restaurant tour. Uh, and, and to be frankly honest, the way we structure our restaurant deals, they're, they're lost leaders. We, we, the project doesn't make any money on the restaurant. It's, it's there in order to create an image for the building and also to kind of service the community and also to bring people to the building. Here, uh, we're not sure if a restaurateur would be willing to come here at this stage. Uh, but we, we do think, though, that other retail uses, whether it's uh, a funky coffee shop or a breakfast place, something that can potentially service you know the park and the residents or the people who are coming from the neighborhoods via bicycle or path, we really want to introduce a retail concept here. We just don't know what that is yet at this stage, Eric. Okay. And then um, I'm just going to go back to your unit count. I know you guys said you weren't sure yet, 250, 280. Um, yeah. Are you envisioning those units being condos or apartments? No, it's going to be it's going to be rental. Uh, so so we're, we're developers. We're long-term holders, typically, uh, of, of rental housing. Uh, and it's typically high-end rental housing, like 500, uh, 500 Ocean. Okay. And then do you guys have a number that you're targeting in on for units? I know you're not quite sure yet, but just to give you a little bit of history for the neighborhood, um, we've had multiple unit proposals for the boat yard that have kind of been, I don't want to say bait and switch, but the number is always changing. So it'd be nice to get a definitive response on a number if you can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think 250 to 280 is a pretty tight unit count for us. You know, it's, it's, that's obviously within 10%. Uh, you know, I think our goal in order to obviously facilitate all the public expenditure that's going to be happening here is to try to maximize unit count. So we will be striving towards that 280 number. But then, you know, the development process creates constraints, right? I mean, if we need to expand the size of the retail or there's an impact on parking, that can move the number around. So if you wanted a definitive number, I would say 280 today, it might slip. I doubt it going any higher. Okay, that's Jay Bolton. Uh, Jay Bolton, I believe, has a question. Jay? And you're on mute, Jay. Yeah, no, no, no sorry, no, I'm not. Um, I'm curious that that last slide, or it could have been the slide after this one, um, that you guys flashed up and then flashed back. Can which, you which one was that? that I think it's the one that showed, I think, that the, um, the rental... Uh, build out. Uh, uh, there, there was an Im there was an image slide of some precedent images. Maybe it's that one. Could somebody go back and see if that? Yeah, it might have been the one previous to this one. Sorry. What? Maybe no. one. That one? No, it was. No, I sorry, think it was Jay, the one after Jay, this one. The next slide is actually a slide about resiliency, and it really. Oh, I got you. About, it talks about right. how how the site is uh, addressing that. <laughs> Okay, um, so we're talking about 200, 250 to 280 rental units, right? Yep. Um, I'm curious, and I know you guys have done this before. Um, obviously, traffic becomes yep. an issue. Um, there's already, as you know, issues in the summertime with never mind parking, but traffic um, in and out of Revere Beach area and the Point of Pines area. Um, you know, you got you got um, <laughs> you got a lot of cities uh, flowing through, right? You got. Yep. Nahant, Lynn, you got Swamp Scott, Marblehead flowing right through Revere down North Shore Road. I'm curious, um, what's the game plan? If you guys have any high level ideas on how to potentially mitigate some of this. Yeah, no, I mean, we absolutely have a game plan. And actually, uh, Brian Beisel, our traffic consultant, is going to be talking about traffic uh, in, a, in a little bit. But, you know, I, I think the big picture is this reconfiguration uh, that we're talking about here in terms of creating this roundabout, creating access from the north and the south, 
it, it really helps, I think, better keep people on 1A. And in terms of accessing this site, uh, unless somebody wants to grab an ice cream or go to, uh, or go to uh, you know, Kelly's, they're most likely going to be hopping on directly onto 1A, whether to travel north or to travel south. Uh, you know, at 280 units, uh, and, and Brian can talk about this in detail, re residential parking does not create a significant amount of additional traffic. The preliminary calculations that have been done, uh, and Brian will talk about this in detail, are, are potentially up to, up to maybe a 3% increase during peak times. And Brian can get into the details there. I'm, a little, I'm, I'm not as worried about um, that as I am about traffic. I mean, 500 Ocean's a little bit of a different animal because you got Wonderland right there, right? So there's a lot of people that travel in and out of Boston on the T every day. Yep. Uh, probably a lot of them might not even own automobiles. So I'm curious, um, you know, it, it just seems like if we have, you know, 250 units, two cars per unit, now we're talking 500 more cars on the road in the morning at a rush hour, right? Yeah. So, 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 so you know, Ryan, you're, you're the expert at this. So. Yeah, no. And, and, and you know what? I mean, fortunately, we have, we have real data uh, in terms of one Beachmont, which is a project we developed uh, uh, near the Beachmont train station, obviously 500 Ocean. This is a different animal because it doesn't sit as close to transit as those two projects do. We also have other projects in the area, whether it's, uh, you know, projects that we're doing in East Boston or Chelsea or Quincy or Somerville that have maybe more similar conditions as it relates to adjacencies or distances from public transit. Uh, this may surprise everybody, but 500 Ocean and one Beachmont park at about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 per dwelling unit. There is no two cars per apartment. It's literally less than one car per, per, per apartment. Here, based upon our traffic analysis and, and experience with other projects, we're anticipating demand to be one to one. So what we're going to be proposing is a parking ratio of one parking space per dwelling unit. And something Bob may touch upon a little bit later is it's my understanding that the neighborhoods are instituting parking policies in terms of resident stickers. This building would not be allowed to have any of those resident stickers. So in essence, you know, we really feel that our parking calculations are spot on and to help ensure the neighborhood that there's going to be no parking on their streets, the people who live here will not be allowed to park in those neighborhoods. And so we I, looked at alternate means, Damien, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Have, have, have we looked at alternate means to try to transport these people over yeah, to the I building? Mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, sh sh shuttle service or limited shuttle service there are buildings on the beach that do it. Yeah, I mean, that would all potentially be part of our uh, kind of amenity package for these residents. But yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't address that sooner, but definitely. Uh, Gina Vandeloup from Point of Pines, I believe, has a question. Gina? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Damien, can you speak just a little bit about some of the, uh, the things that John Powers <laughs> brought up earlier about the infrastructure? Um, so, for example, our pumping station, our sewer... Um, you know, we talked earlier about the fact that the water displacement, um, you know, right now, uh, you say has, uh, you're going to build for about two acres by one foot where there isn't anything now, but now we've got to take into consideration a different facility, right? That has, um, yeah. a pavement, et cetera. How are all of those things being, uh, taken into consideration and the impact on in existing infrastructure? Yeah, absolutely. And you know what, that's actually a great transition because the next slide is, deals with that in terms of infrastructure and stormwater. And, you know, one of the things that I just want to point out before I pass it on to Katie, our civil engineer, is that, you know, the site is currently almost totally impervious. Uh, there's going to be a massive introduction of permeable surfaces here. And, and with that, you know, all the things that uh, Frank talked about early on, th those are all requirements upon us to make sure that we, we do not negatively impact the infrastructure and hopefully improve upon that. And so, Katie, are, are you on and able to speak, please, to this slide? I'm here, and I'm, I'm Katie Cruz from Hancock Associates. Um, and um, just to talk about stormwater, um, a lot of times we compare the existing condition to the proposed condition. And like Damien said, in the existing condition, the majority of this site is paved right now, and it's covered with vehicles. And there really are no provisions for stormwater management or stormwater treatment right now. 
Um, one thing that is advantageous about this site is the topography. Um, it all slopes downhill towards the river. So this is this site is isolated in terms of stormwater, um, both from Gibson Park and also from the surrounding community. Um, and be, because of that, the proposed development will not have an impact on flooding or stormwater, um, either by overland flow or to the municipal piped drainage systems um, because all of the water will flow directly to the river. Um, there isn't really an opportunity for ponding on the site because of the topography all going downhill. Um, so, it, so that's a, a really big advantage to this site. Um, and like Damien mentioned, we will be removing a lot of the impervious surfaces and adding landscaped areas and rain gardens and porous pavement um, that are part of the stormwater management system to treat the water, but also that allows a lot more opportunity for infiltration into the groundwater that doesn't exist right now. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention about this is that this, this project will go through permitting with Conservation Commission, local site plan review, as well as various state agencies. Um, and the stormwater system will be designed to meet the Massachusetts DEP stormwater standards. So it'll go through thorough review. Um, and I have every confidence that it will meet those standards and be um, viewed favorably um, with this system with low impact development um, and all of that. So, you know, in general, this will be a big improvement over the existing condition for a stormwater and flooding standpoint. Um, and then also just to talk a little bit about infrastructure improvements. Um, our project team has met with DPW, the city engineer and the water and sewer departments. And we have an understanding of some of the maybe current supply issues and issues with water and sewer currently in the neighborhood. Um, and one thing that was requested for the project was to provide a looped water system, um, which we are proposing is that kind of zigzag blue line that goes through the site. Um, and that will that'll be an improvement for water pressure and water availability. Um, so our team certainly wants to coordinate with DPW um, on uh, you know, addressing the project impacts to the system. Yeah, and then, you know, I think somebody earlier on in terms of additional infrastructure had brought up natural gas. Natural gas is a huge issue right now in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, we've experienced personally uh, tremendous issues uh, with the natural gas providers. Revere, unfortunately, is kind of at the end of the line. Uh, and, and getting additional service or getting the capacity is incredibly challenging and it's actually cost prohibitive. And what's happening simultaneously as it relates to uh, future goals of energy independence and renewables, uh, a lot of municipalities in the state of Massachusetts are pushing developers away from natural gas. Uh, and we're actually taking that upon ourselves to do our rider building uh, at the base of Revere Beach, we converted that building to all electric during construction. We don't anticipate utilizing natural gas here. There may be a small amount for the restaurant, uh, but otherwise we don't anticipate it. And that's all related to the fact that at some point in the future, we will be getting our electricity from solar, from wind, and being part on that, being on that electrical grid is incredibly important. So uh, we don't anticipate tapping your existing uh, gas service here and, and in any way negatively impacting uh, the current capacity and usage. Thank you. Anyone? Just another question related to uh, topography. I'm getting a text from a resident in the area that has a question. Um, Will this land need to be raised up for this development to be put into the ground? Like in terms of the, the land, you're not going to raise it up, right? Because water flows downhill. So that's the resident's concern is that this land would be raised up and that water would flow down to the neighborhood. Yeah, no. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Our grading would be um, 
only for the purpose of, you know, draining water in the direction we needed to go. Um, so it would mimic the existing site grades, but of course we're adding parking areas and stuff. So we'd need to change things just only slightly. Um, but we would not be sending any water to any other direction other than the river. So there will be no impacts on the surrounding. Yeah, and, and then Eric, I mean, uh, and, and the architects can kind of chime in as well too. The, the base flood elevation here is 10. And, and our goal, you know, we, we have to build above that base flood elevation in terms of our occupiable space. Uh, there, there may be small points where the building is raised, but then at the same time, we're not allowed to raise a building and displace water onto someone else's property. So when that happens, we have to, in a way, balance it on our site. And the way Katie is describing, and it is advantageous to us because of the way the grades work and flow down towards the river, we're, we're able to effectively do that. So no, this will not impact any abutting properties in terms of uh, creating any form of obstacle or creating a condition that would worsen someone else's flooding condition. Mm -hmm. And we're not allowed to do that, number one, and we wouldn't do that, but yes. Uh, Lisa Peterson, uh, do you have a question, Lisa? I have a question about the gas incident. Okay, very good. Uh, any other questions? We have Nick Malaysian. Nick and yeah. Gary Bolton, I think, have questions. So why don't we start with Nick? All right, I just want to kind of reiterate what Damien and uh, Kate said that any development like this from a conservation point of view and stormwater and flooding, they can't displace the water to someone else's property. They have to they have to bring everything up to code. That building is going to be so big, uh, going to have so much stormwater coming off the property from drains or whatever or gutters or whatever. They need to bring everything up to mass standard, Massachusetts code and regulations, and they can't displace it to affect the neighborhood or anyone else's property. It's, it's part of the laws and the regulations of Mass DEP. So I just want to reiterate what they have already uh, stated. Thank you, Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised at the moment, so. Yeah, uh, and then, yeah, yeah. the next question is, is Brian Bizel available? Because Brian was dealing with two meetings at one time. I want to see if he's Brian on. Brian right. is on the call. And I'm here, everyone. Great to see you. Yep, we can hear you, Brian. All right, very good. Hopefully, everyone enjoys my uh, my six year old daughter's purple walls behind me. <laughs> <laughs> very intimidating, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, so Brian Bizel from from Howard Stein Hudson, we're the transportation consultant. Um, so there's really, it, I know there's been a bunch of meetings. I haven't been on any of them, but been you know been hearing back from from the team, of course, on things that have come up. So I'm just going to go through a bunch of things that. That have that have come up um, either tonight or, or previously, and then you know would love questions. Um, but really, they, there's three components for transportation for this area, right? The first one is MassDOT's reconstruction of the General Edwards Bridge. Um, that is in conceptual design phase. It's been going on really since before this overlay uh, process began. So it's it's kind of and good in some ways, but it's just you know it's another another moving part in the area. Um, as part of this overlay master plan, there is what we see on the screen here, the, the changing of the existing southbound ramps. Right now, the southbound ramps, because of the, the on-ramp, is what we call a clover leaf, right? It's, it's part of, it's, it's the big circle, or in, in this case, it's a very small circle, um, you know, from a highway standard. But it takes up a lot of room, right? So essentially, what you're, where you're seeing the basketball court on this diagram that's actually where the existing on and off ramps go. That's how far they swing out away from, from 1A. And then you end up with the big infield, right? That's nice open space and it's grass, but it's completely unusable and, and inaccessible. So the idea was to do more what we could, would consider a, a, a diamond interchange um, where you have the off ramp coming down from, from right to left here. Um, just to orient everyone that the bridge is to the, off the page to the right. And that's that's north and then to the south is to the left and then as someone mentioned before instead of having a, a loop ramp to get back on southbound we would change that to the ramp that you see heading to the left side of this this concept that is a new plan it, it doesn't go through riverside right it doesn't connect to, to haw street or anything like that it, it runs along mass dot property that's in between um the residential neighborhood and the existing 1a main line um and what that does is it opens up a lot of free space. Now, 
in the morning, which I'm assuming everyone on this call is aware, there's a lot of people that get off on the southbound off ramp and then connect to the Linway. And with Mass DOT, and we, we sorry, I should back up. We, we sent them this morning, actually, an alternatives analysis. And what we're showing here is the roundabout. And Sean did a great job before standing in for me, but Sean, please call it a, a roundabout and not a rotary, which, which I'll get into in a minute. But the idea between this roundabout plan is that people coming off of 1A, they'll have to slow down, but they won't have to stop. Um, you know, right now, of course, they come off and, and they yield when they get to the Linway, but they're not stopping anywhere on that off ramp. So if you had a four way intersection here, you'd have that large volume, which is about 750 vehicles in the morning peak hour um that come off off the ramp uh off the main line and onto the ramp so we would the idea with the roundabout is that everyone slows and goes through it equally as slow but nobody actually ends up stopping and you don't have to worry about that that queue backing up on onto the main line but we do have you know like i said there's alternatives in mass dot will decide you know which ones they think is better in you know in conjunction with this process but again the idea here is to make more open space that's usable from from gibson park right to try to connect it to gibson park and and sean's sketch here shows all that open space with with the the basketball court in the middle of it um as part of this open space plan too as was discussed the existing parking would also get um have its access changed to offer the roundabout um and not have to go through the neighborhood any longer um, and then I think people are aware that, you know, there's parking on the, on the very north end that that's not associated with the residential development, but would actually be used for the, for the park. Um, and then the, the, another huge benefit, which is shown here on, on the red lines or the pink lines is we would be providing under the existing underpass, which right now is just the, the on and off ramps. We would be providing a, a, uh, multi-use path. So pedestrians and bicyclists. So you can see here on that along that pink line, they'd come underneath the existing overpass and then left into the park, right? So right now, if you're in Port of Pines, excuse me, Point of Pines, you have to go all the way down to Riverside neighborhood, of course, and then and then backtrack back to the north. But here, you'd be able to walk or bike directly from the Linway to get into Gibson Park in, in the waterfront. Um, and then the last part, you know, of course, is, is regate that is the development. So you know, 280 units, 250 units, and, and someone else had mentioned it before, this isn't, you know, right near Wonderland. So we do have ways to compensate for that in, in our calculations. It's called the mode share. So when you're down by the T stations, your mode share, which is the mode of transportation that people will choose to use, it's it's much more transit oriented, obviously, right? So compared to this site. So we are, like Damien said, the parking demand will be higher here than, than down by Wonderland, but also the people relying on actually using those vehicles every day would be higher. So we account for that in our traffic study. And with all that said, 1A right now coming over the bridge has about 4,000 vehicles in the morning peak hour, right? So that's one hour, just say 7.30 to 8.30. It's, it's, it could be 7.15, 8.15, or it's, better, it's basically any one hour time in 15 minute increments. So there's 4,000 vehicles coming over the, the bridge right now in both directions. This development would be adding about 50. So it's, it's, it's 50. It's, you know, it's about one a minute. It's not nothing. But compared to the volume that's already on 1A and already on the Linway, the Linway, again, has about 900 um, uh, vehicles on it in one hour. Um, so it's, it's really a small increase um, that would be included into these volumes. Um, I think that's everything i had heard to this point but if anyone has any other questions happy to discuss oh one last point was the the roundabout and rotary discussion so everyone's familiar in massachusetts with rotaries they're the you know the big traffic circles that we have um people go into them very fast the approaches um come into the rotary straight and because the rotary itself is so big people are able to drive through that circle at a higher speed Roundabouts are much, much smaller than that. This roundabout that you're seeing here would essentially fit inside the infield of a rotary. And the idea is not only the, the tightness of it to slow people down, but also as you come into the roundabout, there's deflection medians, which we're showing here on this sketch just as, as green say. And those deflection medians also make people slow down and provide better sight lines for, for pedestrians and, and for pe vehicles in the, rotor, uh, the roundabout already. So. You know, roundabouts and rotaries, they're, 
you know, unusual names and they sound similar, but they're actually operate very differently. Um, and so I, I don't want anyone to have that negative connotation of we're making the same mistakes of, of the past. It's, it's really a much different uh, animal here. And Brian, just to clarify, although these are related to the bridge, these can be done in advance of the bridge replacement. They are uh, unrelated to the replacement process, correct? They can be done essentially now. Right. So the, the bridge project, the concept that I've seen, which is a, a very preliminary uh, concept, it modified the northbound ramps, but it didn't touch the southbound ramp. So then when we started looking at that as part of this overlay process, we kind of, in some ways, it's a, a good thing that, that these ramps aren't part of the bridge project because these ramps can go quicker than, than the bridge project. The, the bridge project is on the tip, which is Mass DOT funding. Um, for a transportation improvement project, but it's not going to be funded until at least 2025. And obviously, you know, it's a very big bridge. It's, a, you know, needs to be designed still. It's a huge um, lead in for the design of it structurally and, and, and from grading perspective. So, you know, the bridge is a long term plan. And, you know, our hope and vision is that these, the southbound off ramps can be modified before that in a, in a faster time frame. This way we get the access to the the park and the waterfront quicker and not have to be tied up with the, the bridge project. Yeah, we had a little technical difficulty and so we're trying to re get the people who raised their hand to ask the question. Yeah. So we're going to start with Walter and Kim Williams. I believe they were next in line uh, and then there'll be a couple of other attendees and then we're going to kick it back over to our Lincoln Deck view. So Walter and Kim. Yeah, yeah. hi, can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question was more to the developers is I want to know, do you happen to know the occupancy rate of apartments in Revere? Because I don't know about other people, but we have a little bit of new apartment exhaustion going on everywhere we drive. We see apartments going up mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what, you know, how full are all these apartments? Are this many people moving here? And I just want that addressed. Why all these new apartments? Uh, sure, absolutely. The, the demand is there. Uh, I can just give you examples from the uh, from the buildings that we own. Uh, one, one Beachmont is, and obviously this is COVID times right now, so there are some implications. And what's happening is you're seeing uh, stronger issues in the core markets like downtown Boston right now because of the lack of students and because of the lack of the offices being open. So you're, you're seeing occupancies dip due to COVID in, in the urban area. For markets like Revere, uh, our one Beachmont project is 93, 94% occupied. 95% is considered stabilized because there's always some apartments turning and somebody leaving or moving. So we're fully occupied at one Beachmont. 500 Ocean is a building that's still in lease up. We just actually delivered uh, the, the last third of that building uh, four or five months ago. We're at about 80% there right now. Uh, I doubt we're going to get through 80% in the winter, but in the spring, we should be fully occupied. Our competing properties, whether it's Ocean 650 or the Beach House, they're, they're all above 90%. I think Ocean 650 is actually 96, 97%. So the demand is definitely there. Uh, people see Revere as a great community to move to. Uh, it has a lot of advantageous things, as, as I think all the residents know. The beach, you know, access to downtown Boston, both from public transportation and vehicular access. So, yeah, the, the, the demand is definitely there. Okay, and one follow-up question. Are there any concessions going to be made for any kind of affordable units in this structure like a certain percent is going to be set aside for maybe disabled people or whatever residents that want to stay in revere so so in essence the city of revere does not have an inclusionary housing policy which would dictate the fact that a certain percentage of the units have to be marked down at a certain rate However, state guidelines require that certain units are built for disabled people. Uh, mm -hmm. They're called group two units and it's about, and it's 5% of all of your units. So, so those are in the building that said, they are not subject to like uh, some type of artificially low rent. So no, these are, these are market rate units. I, I would just say uh, with regard to that, uh, 
Although we do not have an inclusionary zoning, which would, you know, govern the development of this and other private projects, affordable housing is a very high priority for the city. And I can assure you, we are working very diligently on some major affordable housing developments elsewhere in the community. And uh, there should be some more information about that shortly. We're in the planning stages now, but it's a high priority for the city. We recognize the need for affordable housing, but we do not have an inclusionary zoning uh, requirement at this stage. Yeah, okay. Michael Tucker. Oh, Michael sorry. Tucker. And then Lisa uh, Peterson. Michael, you there? Yes. My question was um, with the parking. I know that there's a height limitation down there. How many levels of parking would be there in that proposed um, building? Sure, it's, it's actually gonna be one level of park. So number one, we can't go underground because of the soils issues, both environmentally and geotechnically. Uh, there's gonna be one level of parking and it's gonna be shrouded by some type of active uses, wh whether it's some type of ancillary retail or amenity space. So the goal is you're not gonna see the parking garage like 500 Ocean. 500 Ocean has two levels of parking, which you don't see off of the beach, but it's one level of parking. And the parking ratio for the residential was what, 1.1? 1, 1? Uh, one, 1, 1, uh, 1, 1 to 1, exactly. So one parking one space per, yeah, per, per dwelling unit, yes. Now, what's the potential for commercial? Where are you parking on that, on the property? So, so uh, Number one, we don't know how much commercial is there yet. Obviously, there's a good amount of site area. It's being studied right now. Uh, you know, we don't think we'll be creating a, a, a commercial use that would be incredibly high demanded for parking. If it is, you know, uh, some type of coffee establishment or small breakfast place, we're, we're pretty positive we'll be able to accommodate that somewhere on site. We do have surface parking areas as well. So uh, we would have to work through that. But the plan would be to have it on site. Amy, and as you may have figured out, and as I should have noted in the introduction of Michael, he is the chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals, so he has ah, a okay. interest in these matters. Nice to meet you, Michael. We've never met. Could I be added as a participant, please? Because I think I'm restricted. I can't get on for video. You okay. cannot be restricted. Uh, Lisa Peterson, I believe you have a question. I do. Thank you. Um, the traffic study that you did, was that during COVID? No, so um, please uh, correct me if I if I get the name of this wrong. But the they um, Revere did the waterfront traffic transportation study, and they did a very extensive um, data collection. I believe in late 2018, and we utilized those traffic volumes. So pre COVID, um, and but you know very similar to what would have been out there as of March 11th of 2020. Okay, well, just to point out a difference between Beachmont and where we are, um, we do have everyone flowing from the north of us through here or the Lynn Marsh Road. Once you get to Beachmont, you can go through Winthrop, you can go through the airport road, you can take Route 16, you can go up Park Avenue. So there's a lot of places for traffic to disperse, which is yeah. not the case where we bottleneck right here. And looking at this is very generous um, in the land behind the parking lot. So if you've been in the parking lot, you can see that there's a slope up to the highway. I don't know if those are bushes or trees, but there's really not that much room as far as the perspective of the drawing, which I know you're not saying is, is exactly everything. But then also the off ramp on the other side, there's people that have houses there. So what, yeah. What is this change about? Is this going to go down Hayes Avenue when we um, go southbound? And is we going to eminent domain some houses on the other side? No, absolutely yeah. not. Yeah, so it, it's 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 two different. So let's just start on, on your side, right? The southbound on ramp, right? What we're showing here is is too far away from 1A. This would basically encroach on the parkland. This is you know, just a sketch. We have the, the submission that we gave to DOT, DOT today is a much more defined uh, design, and there is room to to basically put the ramp in between um, the property line and Hayes. We'll be we won't touch Hayes Street. We'll be we'll connect back to Route One A Main Line before we get to the Hayes Street intersection where the you know the pedestrian crossing is. Um, so 
you know, there, there won't be any impact to, to Riverside at, at all. Um, and right, there's bushes on there. There's an embankment. You know, we, we might need to do a little bit of a retaining wall to fit that in there. But um, So are you going to come out at John Ave? Because there's a crosswalk there. Right. It'll, so it'll, it, it'll be back on 1A, you know, what we call the main line before you get to John Ave and, and where Hayes so Avenue. is. coming out of our neighborhood at John Ave are going to have to first contend with the traffic from the building that you're building? Or we'll have to go all the way to the end of Mills Ave? Well, right. So the people coming out of John Ever or Hayes Ever are already contending with, with all the traffic that's coming down 1A. And yes, I mean, we will, you know, the residential development, of course, will be increasing that, but it, it's very slight. As I said, it's about 4,000 cars on 1A and for in one hour, and we'd be adding about 50. Um, so that's, it's, it's a very small difference. And in fact, the traffic volumes fluctuate more than 50 vehicles every day, just from day to day, you know, not for any reason other than just people having different schedules. There's about, it's typically about a 5%, um, 5 to 10% fluctuation in, in traffic volume. So if you have 4,000 one day, you could very easily have, you know, 4,200 uh, 4, or 4,300 the next day. So the 50 would fit within there. So you would, it's, it, you know, the word it's, it's imperceivable. You wouldn't even notice the difference as you were coming out of Hayes Avenue. Uh, because of this development and then your comment on what we're showing here for the northbound on ramp you're absolutely right it's right next to houses there that's not part of this master plan overlay process or the residential development that is we got that from the the mass dot concept for the uh, ge bridge reconstruction um it's just the concept it you know it, it the idea is is there's a lot to it but basically they want to move if you look at the lower right corner they want to move the on-ramp further to the south because right now it's the on-ramp is too short and the acceleration lane is not long enough. And now you'd be accelerating up the bridge, which makes it even harder. So the idea is to move the on-ramp further to the south. But if you do that, then you're going to be impacting where the existing off-ramp is. So they're showing it here, moved over. We're, we're showing it, but that's not part of this project, uh, this project the overlay or the development. That's something that Mass TOT would, would be leading, and they'd have to go through a public process if they were going to impact And nothing, nothing we're area. contemplating or they're contemplating will involve the taking of any properties. Right, no, so th their concept, right, good, thank you. Their concept shows it um, within their property line that's along 1A, so it, it wouldn't be doing any uh, takings from the residential uh, units over there. Patrick Can I clarify one other part, please? Go ahead, Lisa. Thank you. Um, so this is the existing ramp, but now it's just going to be redirected to the roundabout. So the buses are going to go around, and if there's a bad traffic report on Route 1A and people want to jump on the beach, they're going to go down here and around the roundabout first? Right. This doesn't... This doesn't change any of the, the, the wider regional travel routes. It just impacts you know the the amount of space that's available right here in, in this area it's, it's not it's not constricting anything that that happens now for the buses um and it, it, you know the buses would still be able to go around the roundabout and, and get off southbound and then come over to the the little circle that's you know along the linway where they have their bus stop and then and then come back on and, and get back on it almost just doesn't seem necessary it seems like you just need a clear path into the park and a feed into your area and the rest of it doesn't look to me like it needs to be changed. Yeah, and that, and so right, so the the biggest part is is moving the on ramp, right? It's it's getting rid of that circular on ramp that's taking up room and, and wasting open space. And like, uh, unfortunately, we don't have it, but there is the another alternative that does that. It creates just a, a regular four way intersection um, where the off ramp comes off and and then meets the the road that you know. Right now, it's just a ramp. I call it Gibson Park Drive, and in, in this in the study that we submitted. But there is a much simpler um, or more typical layout, I should say. Um, but again, Mass DOTs, why they wanted us to study this roundabout is they don't want to stop the people as they're coming down the off ramp. And, and the roundabout gives us that ability to not stop them. But, you know, it, maybe they, when they see the two concepts next to each other, they'll realize that, you know, that the four way is simpler and, and easier to implement. And that's a single lane roundabout? It's a one lane roundabout, right? Not. Again, rotaries and traffic circles that would have multiple lanes, the roundabouts or, or, or one lane. 
Thank and you. the southbound off-ramp would still connect to the boulevard, but it's a more circuitous route, hopefully discouraging some of that uh, uh, shortcut traffic. Well, it seems Keaton to me like the ramp that we have would work well. The ramp that we have just comes up underneath now and circles onto it before you even get near our neighborhood. Why would you change that? Well, it takes up an awful lot of space that can otherwise be used for, you know, public park um, activities. Yeah, no, right. the, the redesign of the ramps is not in any way to, to redirect or, or change travel patterns. It's just to get more open space. Yeah. Um, no, so it's not, it's no. not a... But Brian, the current ramps don't allow any access to Gibson Park. Well, that's true too. Thank you, David. And, yes. You know, right now, the only access to Gibson Park is through the Riverside neighborhood. It's one of the things that we've heard early in the process that was important to adjust. And, and that's part of the, re the benefit of this these, these ramp changes. Right. But if you take and make your little um, park road and you feed into your area and you leave the ramps the way they are, I don't see where the problem is. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be allowed to, you're saying that the, the parking lot driveway that connects to, um, you know, changing the way it connects, we wouldn't be allowed to connect that parking lot, the existing parking lot to those existing ramps. The, the state considers that a limited access highway, the ramps, and you can't, not that you can't, but it's very hard to get um, That's the a connection to, to, to the ramps. You. This is the existing you, condition. Sir. All of those ramps are kind of going in the same direction towards, uh, uh, there's one coming up and going north, and the other is going towards uh, Point of Pines from, so. It doesn't um, look like you have any plans for that green space. This is, this is the uh, existing thank condition. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Uh, Patrick? Thank you, Bob. I uh, just wanted to kind of uh, go back to Damien for a second, and I appreciate uh, you talking about the project. Obviously, um, your current projects have been really nice, and I, I was, uh, you know, I, I was in support of those, and you know, we'll, we'll continue to review these, and so far, things do look pretty good, but, you know, again, it's going to come down to all of the details. One of them that you mentioned was parking in the one-to-one -one ratio, which uh, I just wanted to ask you, how adequate that is right now with your current um, um, uh, investments that you have on the beach. And then realizing that um, whatever parking you have off street is all that the residents or your tenants, your future tenants will have available to them because you do know they won't be allowed to, uh, to uh, get resident permit stickers, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you may have been off on this, but I actually acknowledge that I was informed by the city Right. about the resident sticker program. And so uh, we're fully aware that any development here would not be eligible for resident stickers, whether it's in Riverside or Point of Pines. And as it relates to existing demand, uh, you know, we have a lot of good data points, not only from our projects, but also from the other competing projects. We obviously share information. R right, right now, and I had mentioned this previously as well too, uh, we're parking at about 0.7 to 0.8 per dwelling unit. And this is not COVID related stuff. This is even before COVID. Uh, those sites obviously are closer to transit. So we do think there'll be a slightly increased demand, but we, it, but it, it will not exceed one to one. And, and we have that condition in other properties, whether it's in Somerville or Chelsea or Quincy. So we feel very, very comfortable. Uh, this is obviously an enormous, this is a hundred million dollar private development uh, we would never risk the ability to lease units because we can't provide enough parking. Right. So we, we've absolutely st studied it and we feel very comfortable. And, you know, with more cars comes potentially more traffic, right? So it's, it's, it's a balancing act and we feel very comfortable that with what we're going to provide, the fact that, you know, we may do something that Beach House does. We may provide a shuttle service to transit as well, too, uh, as, a, as a means. And that's something that I think is, is totally feasible. We, we think we'll, we'll be absolutely covered by, by what we have without impacting the neighborhoods, Councilor. Great. No, and that's just, and again, I, I assumed you did know that. Uh, it's one of those where, you know, as you're aware, this project, if, if, if it was to get off the ground, it, you know, we'd be talking about completion years from now. But, um, you know, when that comes around uh, and, you know, sometimes people come back looking for... Um, special conditions and of course just so we everyone knows it's been laid out and, you know, and again you know so we all know uh, where everyone stands on parking but absolutely appreciate, you, appreciate it 
Yeah, thank, thank you. Just to, you. Give you, just to give everybody a general sense, you know, four or five hundred Ocean Avenue, because of the original zoning when that was originally master planned, the required parking ratio was a one point three five. We we are literally sitting on over a hundred vacant parking spaces that are getting no use whatsoever uh, that we can't do anything with. So uh, it is it is different here, uh, but it's it's definitely not uh, it's definitely not more than we're thinking. Thank you. Yeah, Appreciate thank you. Hi, this is Eric. Just a couple of follow-up questions for Damien. Sure. Um, piggybacking off Councilor Keith, um, earlier you said you just said you're at 0.8 for your spaces, but earlier you mentioned that their your building was at 80% capacity. Does that 0.8 is that contradicting against 100% capacity being full, or is it about the 80% capacity that you have? No, so, so that that's equalized uh, as of 100%. But we have other buildings that have the same ratio. So one one Beachmont okay. is between a 0 0.7 0 0.8, and that's at full capacity as well too. Okay, and are yeah. these units are these units going to be studios, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom? Uh, it's it's going to be a variety of units, so it's going to be kind of the full gamut. Uh, where you know I, I would say you know the unit mix isn't done, and that's and that's where the change may happen between two fifty and two eighty, right? If you do more larger units, you'll be closer to the two fifty. More smaller units. At the same time, you know, based upon what we've seen in terms of demand in the marketplace. You know, my, my gut is I don't I don't have the current unit mix in front of us. We'll probably have the equivalent of two stacks of three bedrooms, so probably ten three bedrooms total. We we actually have exceptional demand for three bedrooms at five hundred ocean. We only have five of them there, uh, and that's really being driven by uh, a lot of empty nesters and a lot of families that have non school age children who are looking to either buy a home, whether it's in Revere or in some of the surrounding communities. Uh, uh, we really don't have a lot of roommate situations. And we think 10 is the right number based upon what we've seen. I would say half the unit, the, the, the remaining half the units would probably be in the two bedroom configuration. And then the remainder would be one bedroom. We'll probably maybe have, I don't know, five to 10% studios. I, I would probably say closer to five. So that's being worked out on now. And, and this is all being driven by the demand that we're seeing in the marketplace. And one sure. thing we haven't talked about, it hasn't become a question. We have zero school age children in any of our buildings. We have that's one. Exactly where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, we have one. We have one. We have one resident who has two school age kids, but that was a divorce of an existing Revere family where the dad moved out and they're sharing custody. So the two daughters are going between the two homes. We, th th there is zero, zero demand for school age kids from our projects. And this is information that I share continuously with people from the city. We, we always get asked about our parking demand, you know, as the city's thinking about planning and our school age kids, and it hasn't changed uh, at all. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just be candid with you, you know, just considering a three bedroom, a three adults, that's three vehicles in my mind and a one-to-one -one ratio might be very tight for that. Yeah. Um, just sharing that honestly with you. Um, another question I have is maybe for Julie DeMauro and in this design here in this picture, um, again, we talked a little bit earlier about the MBTA coming through. There is a bus stop on the fire station side, and I know it's an, a really key component of the proposal for the fire station that we saw for the trucks to enter the building. Is that being changed as well? Or basically, I'm trying to understand where are folks going to catch the bus now in this new model? So I just want to just make it clear that that bus stop that is at the Point of Pine turnaround and next to the fire station is actually being flagged by the MBTA as a stop that may be completely eliminated. Um, they just from their data points, um, that is the bus stop that picks up very, very few passengers. Uh, they try to make that a solar uh, flag stop in which somebody would go to the stop, they would kind of press this button and it would alert the oncoming bus that they were waiting for the bus and to get off Route 1A South, do the turnaround and then get back on. Um, and as many of you know that right now the MBTA is also will be cutting service. That is one of the lines that the service will be cut. Most of their passengers that they pick up are actually coming from Lynn, Swanscott and Marblehead. There's two, there's two bus routes. One comes out of Lynn, one comes out of Marblehead. Um, and that line has been slated to be cut. And I believe, um, and I'm not, I don't want to say it definitely, but I bet that stop will be eliminated. Um, so 
with that reconfiguration and also with the MBTA where we do have a better working relationship with them, we would be able to talk with them about seeing about maybe putting in a stop somewhere closer to uh, Gibson Park or the Riverside. Um, and that, and we'd have to see what the need would be at that time. And the MBTA know that does know that there is something happening on the Riverside. They don't know to what extent, um, but there's also significant development going on on the other side of the GE Bridge, where the old um, GE Gear Works plant is. That the development going in there. There's also plans for the old. Um, Flea Market and Club Morgan space that was there. Uh, there's going to be some commercial mixed use development going there. And Lynn is already planning for that. They're having rapid bus transit lanes being put in right down the Linway. Um, those plans have been approved by MassDOT. Uh, that is going forward. And so that basically is de dedicated bus lanes um, traveling on both in both directions of the Linway uh, along the medium strip. And that is something that they've approached us to um, to kind of entertain and and Bob O'Brien and I have had some some issues with that um, but so there is going to be some major changes all around from the MBTA especially for that one bus stop as well so we're, we're getting close to our normal ending time but we do have several questions still out hey, Bob, there. Can, I, can I address Eric's question too about the part about the parking yes. just so we can get that off so so Eric you're right a three bedroom probably generates more demand than just one car but that's also offset by the fact that there is demand from the smaller units that come with no cars and so that's how we calculate to that that one per dwelling unit ratio and what we've actually seen with our larger units and, and this project may actually uh, even have it more so if you look at the projects that are off the beach, specifically Beach House, Beach House has a much higher percentage of empty nesters than the buildings that are cl uh, closer to transit. And these empty nesters are, are typically people coming out of either Revere, Swampscott, Marblehead, Nahant. They're looking to have close access to the beach, access to the water, and they're typically the ones gobbling up these larger units because they either have an office or a spare bedroom for their children when they come to visit their adult children. And that's kind of where the demand is. I actually see a lot of empty nester demand for this project. The empty nesters don't necessarily like to be like, you know, directly on transit in the beach either. So yeah. there's going to be a balancing act here between that. Okay. Um, Councilor Powers, I believe you have a question. John? Yes, uh, I have a question and a comment. First sure. of all, with regard to uh, Ms. Cruz's comment about water being pumped out into the ocean, uh, I've been down on Mills Avenue when we have these severe storms, whether it be uh, maybe a full moon involved, and, and uh, there's no way that water down there is pumped out in the ocean. Uh, and I would imagine that uh, water at the J&G site would just flow downhill into the Mills Avenue neighborhood, uh, particularly uh, River and John Avenue and those streets there. Uh, getting back to the traffic, uh, I, now you mentioned a studio apartment might not have any cars or, or a smaller apartment might not have any cars, sir? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's potential for that, absolutely. We, we have that in our existing buildings. Well, let me, let me say this. You mentioned Beach House several times. And uh, Beach House right now has, I think, 320 parking spaces for 234 units. So they have an abundance of parking. They also provide a shuttle service uh, mornings and evenings for the residents there. And uh, they uh, bring very little traffic, uh, very little traffic, because of that shuttle service uh, onto the boulevard. I, I just think that, uh, you know, to say a three bedroom unit isn't going to have uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, cars. It wouldn't need a lot of cars. Uh, uh, it's like saying a three bedroom unit doesn't uh, send any kids into the school system, which I think we all know no one that I know of rents a three bedroom unit. Uh, without having kids involved going into the school system. So I think these are all things that we, you know, really have to be looked at a little closer. 
as far as I'm concerned, as a city council. Uh, I know the traffic coming from uh, the north uh, on any uh, morning, uh, not recently because of the, uh, the virus, but uh, we had to put up signs on uh, the streets running from uh, John Avenue all the way down to Mills Avenue that there was uh, no traveling onto those streets, do not enter during certain hours early in the morning because cars were so much backed up on Mills Avenue with that light, people were going down uh, Mills Avenue, going in on John or River and going down Mills Avenue uh, to beat the light, uh, in, in spite of the fact that there are school buses along there in the morning. So I, I think, uh, you know, I hate to keep uh, beating on it, but uh, I, I think the, uh, the, the problem, the two problems that I see down there are flooding for the neighborhood and also traffic. And I, I would hope that uh, uh, we would have a more uh, definitive uh, solution uh, when we have further meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Understood, John. But just to clarify one point, I think Katie Cruz made the point that the, the water does not flow from the G&J site to John. It flows exactly the opposite direction. So I well, don't think there, there will be that kind of flooding problem from this site. Well, I, all I'm going by is the fact that I've been down there when we've had the flooding and I've seen what's happening in the boatyard and I've seen uh, what, what's happening on Mills Avenue. Yeah, and, the uh, boatyard's and a, down the boat there, a different situation. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank we you. have uh, another question from Michael Tucker, and I believe we have a question also from Nixie Breen and Nick Malaysian. And Nick Malaysian. And uh, so let's start with uh, Michael. My we'll question is: uh, if the plan development is this going to be constructed so that it would be um, you'd put water meters and everything in case um, in the future you'd like to put these to condominiums? Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, Michael. Uh, the, the goal he, here would be to separately meter for all utilities, including water, uh, which we've done in uh, all of our buildings to date. Great. I'm just, uh, someone else asked the question, but I'm, I'm just Absolutely. asking it for them. That's very nice. Thank you. Nixie <laughs> Brain, we haven't heard from you if I have your name correctly. So could you uh, unmute yourself and speak up? Pixie, are you available? Okay, Nick. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment because I know that uh, I believe it was Lisa Peterson concerned with the the roundabout that's being put in and the off and on, on ramps. You know, what I mean, the major reason for this proposal, this riverfront project, from what I understand, this master planning is we want to connect Gibson Park and Riverside to the Point of Pines. That's one of the reasons why those off ramps need to be reconfigured and changed around. I just wanted to make that, that is, statement. That is, true. that is correct. Thank you. Okay, I'm not hearing from uh, Nick. Nixie Green, are you available? I cannot unmute. I don't. Please look. You are allowed to talk. You yeah. can. At you, can you unmute yourself? <laughs> Okay, I guess we'll have to move on at this stage. Uh, seeing no other questions, I'm gonna return it to uh, David just to wrap up this meeting and uh, anticipate what we're going to be discussing uh, next week at this time. David? Uh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, so next week we're gonna try to kind of put a, a bow around everything, if you will, and, and kind of show you the both the overall master plan, um, the vision for all of the different pieces and how they tie together, as well as um, the potential phasing and the funding opportunities for this. Because I, I, you know, with the city's help, we'll talk about ways that some of these components can be realized, um, and then ultimately we'll we'll do a very kind of high level overview of the report because we do have a report that needs to go to the Seaport Economic Co Council uh, early in the year. Um, 
so that we can continue on the path that we're on and secure funding for some of these improvements. Okay, uh, very good. Hearing or seeing no other hands, I would just invite well, we Nixie, who still seems to be raising her hand. Uh, can you get on? Apparently not. So. Uh, okay. Just uh, a reminder to answer Kevin O'Malley's question from earlier that was related from someone else. Oh, indeed. Oh. Um, <laughs> Sean, do you want to address that? From the parking lot? We could no, it's the, uh, the public access to the uh, boatyard, Revere, Riverside boatyard site. Yeah, that, was, that was the main reason for relocating and um, extending the surface parking within Gibson Park so that it wrapped around um, the tennis courts to go back. But I, I think in answer to the question, as I understood it, there will be public access to the uh, Riverside Boat Works property and to the pier, but it will only involve the use of very low draft vehicles, either skulls for rowing or kayaks or, you know, boats of that type. There will not be any major boating. There will not be a boat ramp or anything like that at that location. It simply cannot accommodate it uh, yeah, because that's, of the absence of dredging. That's correct, Bob. We, we did look at that early in the process and we talked about, um, you know, we we discussed the possibility of a boat launch there and it really didn't make sense because of the the um, the actual topography of the site, uh, what's going on in the water. It also doesn't make sense because it's added traffic into the neighborhood. What we're really considering at this boathouse would be the kayaks, the rowing boats, paddle boards, um, but it is a public, it is public access. It is open public access. Um, anybody can use it and you know, the vision for the rowing center is really a community rowing center. It's, it's you know, for the local uh, community, it's for kids and adults alike. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you saw last week's presentation or two weeks ago, um, the community rowing center actually has a pretty broad program uh, and is really excited about this location. Okay, we're going to end this with one more question or comment from John Shu, who hasn't uh, spoken today, but always has good comments to add. John? Uh, I was just wondering if next week we would also see some type of a timeline. Um, I'm not interested in dates, but, you know, once the project's approved, what's the next phase? How long does that take? Including yes. the traffic circle, the improvements to the park, and then when the residential units start. Yes, the answer to that is yes. It will not be definitive in all respects, but there will be a general overview, not only of the schedule, but of the steps that will be required to implement the vision that will uh, be illustrated here. So, uh, in a word, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, with that, I will thank everyone for their participation tonight and uh, look forward to uh, our next meeting, which will be our final meeting in this run next week. Uh, and hopefully we'll have all the answers to all of your comments and questions to date. And uh, thank you for tonight and look forward to next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>